to live in pleasure. Um, I'm Jonathan Harvey. I'm the music director of the Camerata. Um, and on behalf of the ensemble, on behalf of myself, on behalf of the music center, thank you for coming on such a sunny day. It's beautiful outside, and we're so happy to make beautiful music in here with you. Um, this afternoon's program is perfect for today's weather, perfect for the springtime. Um, thinking of Tennyson writing that in spring, a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love. That is what this concert is all about, love and everything that comes with it. Infatuation, heartbreak, comfort, sex, frustration, longing, it's all in here today. Uh, this first piece uh, was by Thomas Morley, uh, and he is credited with transforming, more or less, the landscape of English music in the last 10 years of the 16th century with just two publications. The first is a collection of madrigals called The Triumphs of Oriana, which he organized and contributed two pieces to. And it uh, was dedicated to Queen Elizabeth I and more or less solidified the place of the madrigal in English musical culture at that time. And uh, his book, A Plain and Easy Introduction to Practical Music, great title, uh, was a standard composition and performance uh, treatise for two centuries after his death and is still a really important resource for the style and, and practice of music of this time. In that piece, uh, Sing We Enchant It, you heard actual English words and then words that were not English, those falalas. And uh, generally, nonsense words like that in English Renaissance music mean one of two things. Either it was to, to cover uh, a, as, as a replacement for implied uh, savage social satire, or uh, as a replacement for implied explicit sexual activity. In this piece's case, it was the latter. So essentially, this piece's text boils down to, while we're young, we might as well. That's the whole piece. <laughs> this next piece has a different perspective on love. Uh, it's filled with ache, filled with yearning. Uh, it was composed about 30 years before the last piece by composer Madalena Casulana. Kazalan is the first woman in Europe to have her music published and uh, credited herself as the first woman to regard herself as a professional composer, that as her profession, as her practice. And in her dedication to her first book of madrigals, um, she really laid out the idea that this publication was meant as a direct rebuttal to sexism. Um, she wrote that this collection was written, quote, to show to the world to the degree that it is granted to me in this profession of music the foolish error of men who so greatly believe themselves to be the masters of high intellectual gifts, that these gifts cannot, it seems to them, be equally common among women. <laughs> so just like Morley, absolutely, yeah. Uh, just like Morley's falalas, uh, you will hear some euphemisms in this piece as well. Uh, the references to death in the text are not really about death. Uh, rather, they refer to the little death of orgasm 
So when both the narrator and her beloved uh, seem to wish to die through this poem, it's not as morbid as it seems. It's, it's the opposite. So we hope you enjoy. Uh, was a late 15th, early 16th century Spanish artist with remarkably wide expertise. He was an acclaimed composer, singer, poet, and a trailblazing playwright. Uh, in fact, a lot of his music was written for inclusion in his dramatic works. This piece was not one of those. It was uh, first appeared unattributed 
in a 1556 collection of Spanish texted music and is a straightforwardly beautiful admiration of beautiful eyes, uh, rendered in music that to me seems to transform that joy into music so propulsive that you, you have to move to it. It has these rhythmic transformations that are so, so physical, so active. Uh, our next piece is another one infused with dance, but uh, the sentiment behind it is much more complex, uh, as is the language itself. It is not all in Spanish, or French, or Catalan, or Italian, or Provençal, but a little bit of all of those. Scholars think it's a, in a kind of lingua franca of the Mediterranean called sabir, which is used for commerce and diplomacy, uh, and also by enslaved people in the region. And uh, the piece is suffused with this sense of bittersweet regret. The narrator, on a beautiful pastoral day, tells a bird to take a message to their beloved. The twist is that the message is that the narrator is already married. And the music clearly indicates that this is not a comical scene. This, there is real weight and, and tragedy in this. Oh. 
text of that previous work was uh, remarkably steamy, especially given that it's from the Old Testament. Uh, the Song of Songs contains many such passages, uh, supposedly allegorically erotic poems, focused on the close and admiring relationship between God and their people. The poetic form in which a lover's body is described in detail part by part using these elaborate metaphors is actually derived from a medieval Arabic poetic tradition. Uh, and the music was medieval in a way as well. Uh, Dunstable is this pivotal figure in Western music history uh, right at the transition between medieval and Renaissance techniques. Um, as a result, throughout this piece, you heard sort of two different harmonic worlds happening. Uh, at the ends of phrases, you would hear sort of this more stark angular sound uh, that relied on the fourths and fifths, those intervals that were more important in medieval uh, techniques and medieval repertoire. But in the middle of these phrases, there's this sort of sense of lushness, and that comes from the thirds, the, the, this interval that becomes regarded as a more consonant one as the Renaissance proceeds. And so this, this piece is a sort of bridge that uses techniques from both of these eras that he kind of straddles. The next piece uh, will take us back to the English magical school of that first piece by Morley. This time the composer is Thomas Wilkes, who was a generation younger than Morley. Uh, the two of them were very close, though. When Morley died, Wilkes wrote and published a musical elegy for him entitled, Death Hath Deprived Me of My Dearest Friend, a Remembrance of My Friend Thomas Morley. Musically, this next piece by Wilkes is filled with sort of touching dissonance, and it uses both of the euphemistic text devices that we've commented on so far. The falala is prominent, as is the wish for death, and the poetry also includes this interesting examination of the paradox of love, the idea that love is frying in frost, love is singing in tears, uh, love is dying while feeling very much alive. Uh, so we hope you enjoy.
Claudin de Sermizy was one of the highest profile composers in France during his life. Uh, he served as a musician for multiple generations of French monarchy, uh, including rising to the post of music director for the Royal Chapel of France. Uh, later in his career, he held a simultaneous position at Saint-Chapelle. Uh, one of the perks for that job was that he got a big house in Paris. And in an interesting connection to our time, uh, Sermizy hosted refugee priests in that house when their northern French home of Saint Quentin was invaded by Spain. Although he was widely acclaimed across Europe, by 15 years after his death, he was essentially forgotten, and his music was really only revived in the 20th century. The composer of the next piece, Jacques Arcadelt, uh, was also French, was a contemporary of Sermizy, and was also very highly acclaimed during his life. However, his reputation did not dissipate after his death. He published his first book of madrigals in 1538, and between that date and 1654, it was reprinted 58 times, which is almost double the circulation of the next most popular madrigal collection. Uh, this particular piece, Il Bianco e Dolce Cigno, that we're about to sing, uh, in itself was also tremendously popular. Uh, it depends very heavily on the death metaphor that we've been revisiting. Uh, according to legend that goes back to antiquity, uh, swans are silent up until the moment of their death, at which point they sing. So in essence, the poetry of this work says, swans sing when they die, I sing when I die a much sweeter kind of death, and if possible, I would like to die in that way a thousand times every day. <laughs> Thank you. 
the composer of that previous work is um, shrouded in, in quite a bit of mystery and confusion. As I was thinking about how I wanted to, to communicate the, the confusion, the, the, the professor in me wanted to have like a whiteboard or something, because this, <laughs> this requires a diagram. It really does. So stick with me here. There are two women musicians with the last name Aleotti, Vittoria and Raffaella. Some scholars insist that they were the same person. Others insist that they were sisters. And ironically, a lot of that ambiguity stems from the writing of the father, who was a prominent architect in Ferrara. Giovanni, the father, is said to have had five daughters, one of whom's name was Vittoria. He wrote the dedication to Vittoria's one published book of madrigals, which the piece that you just heard was from. In that dedication, Giovanni writes that while his oldest daughter, who goes unnamed in this dedication, was being prepared to become a nun and trained in music, his younger daughter, Vittoria, overheard this training and, and really took to music in an intense way. And um, this was Vic Vittoria's inspiration to compose. And according to the dedication, Vittoria showed such aptitude after hearing her older sister uh, that the teacher recommended that she be sent to the musically outstanding convent of San Vito for training. Raffaella Aleotti was a highly regarded musician at the convent of San Vito for many years, acclaimed widely for her ability to lead ensembles. After Vittoria's madrigal collection was published, there is no further record of her existence. In Giovanni's will, Raffaella is mentioned as one of his daughters. Vittoria is not. So Vittoria changed her name to Raffaella when she joined the convent, right? Except, in the same year that Vittoria's madrigal collection was published, Raffaella published a collection of sacred music, the first published collection of sacred music by a woman. Giovanni, the father, did not write the dedication to Raffaella's sacred works, does not mention Raffaella's collection of sacred works in any of his, uh, in any of his records. And the musical styles of these two collections are not the same. And for the same composer to have published two collections so different within a single year would have been nearly unbelievable. So whoever wrote this piece, Vittoria, Raffaella, both, neither, um, <laughs> we, we will probably never know in the middle of this web that will likely never be untangled. But it is very interesting. <laughs> the, the last piece on today's, oh, well, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Uh, the last piece on today's program is by the renowned lute song composer, John Dolt. Dolt. Uh, he's the Renaissance musician whose music Sting recorded several years ago. And the collection that this piece is drawn from is organized in a really interesting way. All of the pieces are notated in such a way that they can either be performed by four vocalists or by one singer and a lute from the same score. Sting sang it with lute. Today, we're going to perform the fully vocal version. The poetry is very melancholy, like much of Dolan's music. Uh, he's pining for a lover who's left and is begging her to, to return, to come again. And we hope that you all will come again to Camarada's future performances as we today conclude the first season of our existence. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being part of it. <laughs>